This is Distant Replay. It's time for part two of our Lawrence Phillips episode here on the True Crime Edition of Distant Replay. I'm Ben George. He's Mike Noto. And Mike, as we jump back into this, I encourage everyone to listen to the first part before you go into this and it gives you the whole backstory and lead you up to where we are. But just a quick, quick recap of what we hit before we start this part two. Yeah. So on part one, again, go back and listen, like Ben said, to get the full context. But we basically went through Lawrence's early life and some of the abuses and rough upbringing he went up, uh, he, he went through, up through um, him attending Nebraska and a very violent domestic violence incident that he was involved in against a fellow student. So that's where we went. We went up right to that point where he's won the nas- second national championship with Nebraska in the backdrop, this um, really, really brutal domestic violence incident uh, with a former girlfriend. Mm-hmm. And now under that backdrop, Lawrence Phillips has decided to enter the NFL draft. So that's where we are. We'll pick it up. We'll take it through the end of his life, the tragic end of his life in jail. And we'll do that today on the episode. Make sure you check us out on Twitter, Instagram. Also, please subscribe on YouTube. We appreciate everyone that's done that. Please like the video as well. And also whatever podcasting app you listen on, you'll find us there. So please follow us there as well. So he's left college, Mike, and now there's a lot of expectations on him in in the pros. Oh yeah. So he's one of these guys that I don't remember what he did in college to Kate McEwen, dragging her down those flights of steps, severely injuring her. I don't remember that being a talking point, a major talking point before the draft. Obviously it was mentioned because remember that incident happened in September of the previous college football season. So we're now in April for the draft Yeah, and it did not, it did not impact his draft status at all. He was picked sixth overall by the Rams in like a very, very running back heavy draft. Mm -hmm. So to give it some perspective, like Eddie George was in the same draft. Okay. Okay. So he's picked six by the Rams. He has an average rookie season. I think he rushed for something like 700 yards on a really bad team. Yeah. Um, while this is, while he becomes a pro though, he's developing a very bad alcohol problem. Hmm. I'm talking drinking, you know, um, nights before games till four in the morning, you know, just really, really like sort of reckless behavior from a drinking standpoint. Mm -hmm. Okay. Before his second season, in the NFL, he actually serves a month of jail time, like in the off season for that Kate McEwen incident. So it's a couple years later here, Mm -hmm. but there's finally a resolution to that whole issue there when he drug her down the steps that we discussed last episode in depth. So he serves a month of jail time for that incident in the off season um, before his second season. And the reason I mentioned that is because before his second season is when Dick Vermeil became head coach. Okay. Okay. And during that second season, the alcohol issues are continuing to the point where he was like, it was, uh, he collapsed on the field, like fainted, like in pregame warmups one time. And basically he was drunk on the field. Dang. And that was sort of an uh, issue for Vermeil that he couldn't, he couldn't deal with. Like Vermeil was known as being a, a, a player's coach, but very strict to his rules and like a disciplinarian, you know? Yeah. So the Rams cut him. But what ha- ended up happening for the rest of Lawrence's Phillips' career in the NFL is Dick Vermeil is a player's coach, emotional guy, as we know. He kept on like telling some of his friends in the NFL, like, hey, look, I had to cut Lawrence because of what he did, but you should give him a second shot, right? Okay. He, he did that with Jimmy Johnson. Remember when Jimmy Johnson was the head coach of the Dolphins? Yeah. Well, he convinces uh, Vermeil convinces Jimmy Johnson, hey, look, give this kid another shot because I think he's going to, I think he's going to get his life back together. Right. Well, that only, he only lasted two games with the Dolphins because he hit a woman um, in a Miami club who was refusing like his advances. So that lasts two games. So now he's squandered his opportunity with the Rams. He squandered his opportunity with the Dolphins and he goes to NFL Europe and plays for the Barcelona Dragons. OK, mm-hmm. he actually becomes the MVP of NFL Europe in 1999, which I did not remember. So I didn't remember he had gone to NFL Europe to sort of try to rehab his image. I remember that a little bit. Yeah. I kind of remember that happening. Yeah. Yeah. But unfortunately for him though, Ben, the other thing he developed in Barcelona was a new alcohol of choice, that being rum. Mm. 
So it became a big rum guy over in uh, Europe, apparently. And he brought that back over uh, stateside with him. Okay. Mm. Now, when he comes back stateside, he has another friend, very close friend Dick Vermeil has, in Bill Walsh. And he tells Bill Walsh, hey, look, I think you should look into giving Lawrence Phillips a chance. And Bill Walsh took the approach a lot like Tom Osborne did. We have such a good program here with the 49ers that once we get him in here, I think we can rehabilitate him and he could be a productive player for us. Okay? Right. We can provide the influence he needs. We can, yeah. Now, what I didn't know is he was heavily involved. Do you remember Steve Young's last play in the NFL when he got, a real, he got hit really hard by Aeneas Williams, the cornerback for the uh, Cardinals, and he got like that one final concussion that ended his career? Yeah. Well, the running back during that play that missed the block that led to that sack was Lawrence Phillips. Mm -hmm. Just a a little anecdote there. um, that I I had forgot he even played for the 49ers. Okay? So long story short, he ends up getting cut from the 49ers again, cut from the 49ers in November, and this effectively ends his NFL career. So what he does then is he goes and moves to Beverly Hills. Right? He's living in Beverly Hills with a live-in girlfriend he has that he assaults. In between when he assaults her and when he's going to be brought up on charges for that assault, he went to Montreal to play for the Montreal Alouettes. Okay? Another chance. Another chance. There, when he's there, he choked, uh, he choked his girlfriend there to, un- to unconsciousness after he thought that she cheated on him. Jeez. Okay? Yeah. So we have the issue in college, right? We have the issue that led him to getting released from the Dolphins. We have the issue with the girlfriend in Beverly Hills, and we have the issue with uh, the woman in Montreal now, right? So what is that? Five, four different incidents? Yeah, way too Four different incidents with different women, the common thread the same. Lawrence Phillips beating them and a couple times choking them to the point where they became unconscious. All right? So now, by the end of 2003 here, he's done with football. There's no more chances, okay? He ends up being – he ends up somehow – living in San Diego, he has a, another live-in girlfriend named Amalia, okay? Right. He met Amalia at a gentleman's club, okay, where she worked as a dancer. So they begin to live a lifestyle where she's working every day, he's drinking a fifth of rum every day, and just, like, passing out. You know what I mean? Like, she's basically it's, living with a ghost at this point. It's a very, very dark spot. Yeah, very dark spot. She gets tired of it, obviously. And she's like, look, I I want you to leave, you know, and he obviously does not take it the right way. Uh, When she asks him to leave, he slaps her, punches her, and again chokes her to near unconsciousness. And police called it the worst strangulation they've ever seen where the person actually lived. Wow. That's that says something. So what basically happens is this happens. She's obviously scared half to death of him now. All right. Mm -hmm. He leaves. And then comes back to her apartment. So he leaves, one of those things where he leaves, cools down for a couple days, comes back to her apartment. She immediately calls the cops, like, hey, look, this guy's at my door. He's my, you know, my boyfriend, but I'm scared of him, whatever. A warrant is then issued for his arrest after the cops kind of see, you know, what he did to her. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, what ends up happening in the interim is Lawrence's cousin, who lives in the area, convinced Amalia to meet up with Lawrence and give him another chance. Oh, like, right. hey, look, Lawrence made a mistake. He had never been violent to her before, like in, in their in prior yeah. in their to relationship. Her. Yeah. To her. To her, exactly. So she's like, you know what? I, I love the guy. I'm going to give him another chance. When they have their first confrontation after, you know, the cousin convinces her to, you know, meet up with Lawrence and try to rectify things, mm-hmm. he beat her and choked her even worse. Now this is that to me. This is where this this whole issue with Amalia is where the stories get bizarre because he does what he does to her. Now he wants her back. He says, and he does it to her even worse. He hops in her car and flees to Los Angeles. So he's now going from San Diego to Los Angeles because he knows now I'm going to be dealing with some legal issues in San Diego. Right. While he's in Los Angeles, this is where the story gets bizarre. He's driving around the area of the Los Angeles Coliseum, and he notices kids playing a pickup football game, okay? okay? And he randomly joins, like, a pickup football game <laughs> with a bunch of kids playing on a field, okay? <laughs> Huge NFL running back, okay? Yeah. After the, after the game, 
he, after the game, he notices that like money is missing from his shoe. So he's keeping money in his shoe, which is kind of weird too. But yeah, whatever. Another another bizarre. Aspect. Yeah, it's like it's like a uh, eight year old with his allowance in his shoe. Yeah, you know, sock, going to the candy stick, store yeah, or something. Stuff it down in the sock. I, I did that. Yeah, yeah. Times. <laughs> yeah. So after the game, he notices the money's missing from his shoe, and he accuses the kids of doing it. The kids that he was just playing with. Mm-hmm. They say like, "Hey, look, we didn't steal your money." He drives his car on the field to scare them. Ends up running one of them over with his car to the point where I saw pictures of this car, Ben. The kid went through the windshield Holy and cow. ended up in the hospital with a whole bunch of injuries. He was I, basically mowing kids down on a field over the money he thought they stole from him. I have never heard that story. Yeah, I hadn't I had either. So when you combine the issues in Beverly Hills that he ran away from, the issues in Montreal, the issues with Amelia twice, where he beat her twice to the point where he almost killed her, and then now this issue with running over the kid on the football field, right? He goes to trial for the beating of Amalia. Then he faces charges for running over the kid, okay? When you combine those two issues for Lawrence Phillips, he ends up getting 31 years in jail, right? Most of this was due to the fact of, like, how significant he abused Amalia. Like, some of these pictures are honestly hard to look at if you look them up on the internet. Yeah, I probably will not do that. And when they describe something as the worst strangulation where a person actually lived, like that puts it into context really quick, you know? Yeah. I've seen some pretty bad, you know, domestic violence pictures before, so I can't imagine what that one looks like. And typically, and, and, and that's horrible enough. When The way he ran over this kid, like he's lucky the kid didn't die. I know. Because um, uh, uh, people get ru- people get killed to get run over by cars every day. What, you know? what, kind, what age are we talking about, by the way? Do you know? We're talking about the kids probably, I would probably say 14, 15. Oh, wow. So, 13, yeah, 14. Really yeah. yeah, yeah, like kids, high school kids, young high school kids. He gets 31 years in jail, okay? So now Lawrence Phillips is, go- is going away for 31 years. He's in a prison with, like, the worst of the worst for in, in California. Like, very, very... Uh, inmates with with very very high violence track records, gang members, you know the whole nine yards. What he does in 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 jail that puts him at significant risk is he refuses to join a prison gang. Okay, he refuses to join a prison gang. He doesn't want anyone near him. He doesn't want a cellmate. Like he's very reclusive and to himself. Okay, mm-hmm. this puts him at huge risk within the prison. Because essentially how it was explained from things I've read, and I watched a documentary on Phillips as well, where, like, you had to have someone to have your back in there, you know? The the gangs ran the prison. For him not to join a gang put him at very serious risk, hmm. okay? So he ends up with a cellmate of that, remember, he does not want a cellmate. Like, he wants to just be left alone, yeah. okay? He ends up with a cellmate who's serving, like, life in prison for the execution-style murder of a rival gang member, Right? So this is Lawrence's new cellmate. There's conflicting stories as to what happened. Okay. I'll bring you both sides of the story. So these two are cellmates. Phillips's cellmate ends up dead. All right. Phillips's story was, I was attacked by my cellmate who had a shank, right? So a weapon. I was able to get behind my cellmate in, in our struggle, right? Choke him to the point where he was, I thought I put him in a sleeper hold. I laid him down on the ground. I saw the shank on the ground. I didn't want him to, like, you know, wake up and be able to use it against me. Mm -hmm. So I flushed it down the toilet, right? Mm -hmm. Well, what happens is about 48 hours later, that cellmate who he thought he just put in a sleeper hold ends up dying, Mm -hmm. okay? So now that's Lawrence's story. Right. The state's story when they were were going to indict him on first-degree murder charges was Lawrence was very explicit that he did not want a cellmate. So he killed the cellmate because he didn't want a cellmate. There was no struggle, nothing in the the contents of the cell were not like, you know, turned upside down. We're talking about two really big guys here. So if there was a tussle, you know, the state's case was, you know, all the stuff in the room would have been all over the place. Yeah. Or someone would have heard it or, you know, it it would have been more obvious. Mm -hmm. Lawrence's defense team is saying the story that I just told you. They're saying, hey, look, his story has never wavered from what he told us. We think he's telling the truth. Well, long story short, both sides present their side of the story to a judge. The judge decides that there's sufficient evidence to show that this was a first-degree premeditated murder by Lawrence Phillips, not self-defense. 
and that he's going to stand trial for the first degree murder of his cellmate. Okay. Mm -hmm. By all accounts, people who talked to Lawrence afterwards said that he was just like beside himself when this happened. Like he was just, his lawyer went to go speak with him in the days after his lawyer, the, you know, Lawrence didn't want to speak to him at all. Later that night, Lawrence Phillips, unfortunately, um, killed himself by hanging himself with a bed sheet from the TV stand in his in his cell, yeah. right? So we go from standout Nebraska running back, part of national championship teams, to Lawrence Phillips feeling the only way out for him was to hang himself in his cell, okay? When they found him hanging in his cell, he had a sign. He, he, had a, he taped a sign to himself that said DNR, do not resuscitate. And he, he had a picture of a boy taped to him, like a, of, a, of a young boy taped to him, that no one has been able to identify. Like, no one knows who the boy is. Wow, that's odd. Another kind of, like, odd sort of twist to things here. All right? There's a lot of questions. There was questions in the aftermath. You know, did he commit suicide or was he murdered? Sort of like a Jeffrey Epstein thing, you know? Yeah. You know, was it an inside job within the prison that, you know, they set it up where, you know, gang members could get to Lawrence Phillips for what he did to his cellmate, or did he commit suicide? The state says it's pretty unequivocal based on the evidence that he committed suicide, all right? His family had him tested for CTE, um, but they never released the results from those tests. So that's obviously something that when your behavior starts to get erratic, like with some of these issues that we mentioned here, that's what people first think about these days. Um, they had the test done. The family never released the results, so we don't know if there's any was any CTE present with him. Um, but just a, I know this word is, th is thrown around a lot, but this is just a tragic story um, between what he went through as a child, the victims that later would become, you know, his victims that would deal with, you know, the years of trauma that he was subjected to. And then obviously him tragically ending his life. Just a, a crazy story all the way around. It really is. I do remember a lot of the speculation on you know, whether or not it was truly suicide. I think we see that a lot with, with um, people in jail when they, when they die. Conspiracies always spin up very quickly. But I think a lot of people at the time, I remember them talking about how this, so many people that knew him didn't think that that was something he would do. And we hear that a lot when this, these situations we do. occur. Right? Yeah, we heard it with Aaron Hernandez. You know what I mean? Yeah. We heard it with him. And all, you know, the, some, some of his Nebraska teammates, including Tom Osborne, attended his funeral. Mm -hmm. um, so things so, sort of came full circle there. You know, there's a lot of people, you know, in his life that like, like that loved him and said, you know, and even Dick Vermeil, Tom Osborne, I saw interviewed about him, his high school coaches, you know, they all wish, you know, is there something we could have done to help him where it didn't lead down this path? Mm -hmm. um, and I think the thing was his issues were just ran way too deep. And I don't know there was any helping him, you know, yeah, because um, he went right back to his drinking, beating on women, you know, any chance he got. Mm -hmm. And that little did we know that that issue when he was at Nebraska um, with his with his on again, off again girlfriend, what it would be a precursor to. Yeah. Wow. What, what a what a life. What a story. And uh, pretty tough to hear. He had so much talent, man. He was he was one of the greats. If you weren't around in the 90s, he was a guy that. um Everybody expected huge things out of after his career at Nebraska and just tragic the way it ended back in 2016. So yeah, my, and that's why, and that's why Ben real quick, I think that's why we've gotten so many recommendations to do him for the podcast mm -hmm. because of how great of a player he was. Right. And how things went South so quick for him. Like he's one of the more popular true crime sports topics you're going to see. If you just search the topic generically on the internet. He has a story that fascinates people, and it all starts with the fact that he was a freakishly talented player who just could not escape his demons. Yeah, everything happened so fast, too, at the end there. So, All right, Mike, thanks for taking us through the story of Lawrence Phillips. We'll have more true crime episodes coming up on Distant Replay, so if you haven't followed us on your podcasting app of choice, please do. You can also find us on YouTube. Just search Distant Replay Podcast if you don't, if you, if you never subscribe to us there, you'll find us pretty easily. And uh, we also like to, to talk with people on Twitter and Instagram as well. So thanks for all that, Mike, and uh, look forward to talking to you again pretty, pretty soon. Absolutely. Rate, review, subscribe, and until next time.